that we have not fed thee, but as a mercy to all creatures. The Jews and the Christians, they will never be satisfied until you follow their brand of religion. Respected uh, listeners, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's program in company of two very esteemed uh, and knowledgeable scholars. May I invite uh, my brother Uqba to recite some verses uh, from the glorious Quran. Uh, Brother Uqba. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu hal adullukum ala tijaratin tunjikum min adabin alim Tu'minuna billahi wa rasulihi wa tujahiduna fi sabirillahi bi amwalikum wa anfusikum Thalikum khayrun lakum in kuntum ta'alamun يغفر لكم ذنوبكم ويدخلكم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ومساكن طيبة في جنات عدن ذلك الفوز العظيم وأخرى تحبونها نصر من الله وفتح قريب وبشر المؤمنين صدق الله العظيم In the name of Allah the most beneficent, the most merciful. O you who have believed, shall I tell you of a bargain that will save you from a painful torment? It is that you should believe in Allah and His Messenger and should exert your utmost in Allah's way with your wealth and yourselves. This would be best for you if you only knew. Allah will forgive you your sins and admit you into gardens underneath which canals flow and will give you excellent abodes in gardens of eternity. This indeed is the supreme success. And he will give you the other thing that you desire, Allah's help and victory near at hand. Give to the believers, O Prophet, the good news of this. Verily, Allah speaks the truth. As-salamu alaykum. Alaykum as-salamu alaykum. Jazakallahu khairan. I deem it a great uh, honor to be sitting uh, between two very uh, respected uh, scholars. To my right is uh, Dr. Shaib. To my left is uh, Dr. Zakir Naik. Uh, with in the part of the introduction, tonight's program is an initiative by Al Muntada Al Islami, uh, which is based in London, uh, by CRC, which is uh, the Comparative Religion Study Center, again based in London. Uh, by Harakatu Islahi Shabab al Muslim, Hisam, and by IPCI Birmingham, who have very kindly allowed us to host this program here today. Before we carry on any further, uh, I would like to invite uh, Brother Yusuf Chambers from Al Muntada al Islami to come and say a few words for, uh, for approximately about five minutes. Brother Yusuf Chambers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum Brothers and sisters, I'm not going to delay you too long tonight as we have some much more important <coughs> things going on to my left here. Now, I'm from Muntad al-Islami, as the brother has correctly said, and we've been working in the field of Dawah for approximately uh, 15 years. It wasn't really until September the 11th last year, was it last year or the year before? It's so insignificant, the event actually, that I can't remember. But we've been working in the field of Dawah, hard, striving to let the non-Muslims know about Islam and to let the Muslims understand the true version of Al-Islam as was portrayed by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam more than 1400 years ago. Because there's a lot of enemies of Islam who are trying to do other things, as we know. Some of the projects we were involved in, uh, sending as much as 20,000 uh, pieces of literature 
Islamic literature to the Muslim prisoners, of which there are 5,000 in the UK. Many of you probably didn't know that. Uh, we've sent da'is to schools to explain Islam. We've sent over, uh, over 4,000 da'wah tapes to non-Muslims via da'wah stalls that we have in London and surrounding areas. Uh, and we also support the universities, the ISOCs. And this work is huge. It's never-ending. It's much bigger than one individual. It's much what bigger, actually, in actual fact, than you know, one organization like Munteda in London. This is why we need to cooperate in this work. We need to come together and forget our minor differences, because really, at the end of the day, they are minor differences. And we need to make cooperation with one another so that we can continue to do this type of work. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you know, accept this from all of us and to purify our intentions and to be good, honest, honorable Muslims in, in putting this message, passing this message forward for the whole of humanity. Okay? This is what we forget. Too often, we go around being Muslims, forgetting that it's the whole of humanity. This message is for the whole of humanity, not just for us, not for the Pakistanis, not for the, uh, you know, the Arabs, not just for the Irish. It's for the whole of humanity. And too, too often, we can forget this. So I ask you, brothers and sisters, to support this cause, this event tonight, and future events that we make ta'awn on, and make dua for us that we can continue this work. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaykum as wa rahmatullah. Jazakum Allah wa khairan. Uh, as mentioned by the brother, and just to add a bit to that, uh, all the uh, four organizations that I have met, I've mentioned earlier on, they, ha they all have one thing in common, da'wah and uh, propagating of Islam uh, in, uh, <coughs> in an aud to, to audiences that vary, to places that are different, uh, in different manner and in different way, uh, as such. Our program for tonight uh, sitting entails uh, two speakers uh, and two talks. The uh, and then uh, following that, we will have a joint question and answer session for both speakers. Uh, each session will be approximately the sessions for each speaker will be about 45 minutes each, and thereafter we would have. Uh, a period of about 45 minutes of questions as well. Our first talk tonight. I have, I have only one mic. Yeah, I have only one. Um, our first talk tonight is uh, titled uh, Muhammad in, in the Various World Scriptures, which will be delivered, inshallah, by Dr. Uh, Shuaib to my right. Prior to my inviting uh, of uh, Dr. Shuaib uh, to talk, to give his uh, uh, speech. A prelude to the speaker is necessary for those of us who are not uh, so well uh, or so familiar with the with the speakers. Uh, my apologies if you've been if you know the speakers uh, very well and that uh, if uh, my prelude uh, repeats what you already know, I apologize for that. Dr. Shuaib Sayyad is a medical doctor by profession uh, who, who manages and uh, is, a, a, is a player within the researcher comparative uh, religion uh, sector. He is a speaker at the Islamic Research Foundation too, for which uh, Dr. Zakir on my left is the president. He has been involved with activities at uh, IRF uh, as an active and responsible vo volunteer since its beginning. Dr. Shoaib uh, also handles uh, questions and uh, question and answer sessions on the weekly programs uh, at the IRF uh, in absence of, of Dr. Zaik, of Do Dr. Zakir Naik. Uh, he is, he has been, and he remains a very dedicated and hardworking uh, Dai. Uh, since his college days. In the past couple of years, Dr. Shoaib has been invited by many organizations uh, within India and abroad uh, for public forums and public talks. 
uh, this have been appreciated by audiences uh, who to whom he has delivered uh, uh, talks uh, which uh, at places like Bangalore uh, Man uh, Bangalore Calcutta South Africa Mauritius Botswana it's an international audience as such he has also addressed a Christian conference of over 150 pastors of uh, uh, the clergies on the, uh, from the Christian religion on subjects that vary from concept of sin to salvation in Islam and Christianity. He has had debates with Christian missionaries uh, both within India and outside as well. Uh, Dr. Shuaib has imparted da'wah training too to a lot of uh, young uh, Muslims within Mumbai in particular and uh, Far, up, far away from uh, India too. Without much ado, if I may request uh, uh, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Shuaib to uh, take to the speaker and enlighten us on a very, what is uh, uh, supposed to be a very, very productive uh, topic. Dr. Shuaib, inshallah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. نحمده نصلي على رسوله الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين وكان الله عزيزا حكيما صدق الله صدق الله ما العظيم قال رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Mr. Chairman, my colleague Dr. Zakir Naik, respected elders, and dear brothers and sisters, may I greet you all with the Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The subject, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the world scriptures. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his mercy, to see that whole of humanity if in the right, on the right path, and he sends prophets and messengers for this very purpose that mankind, he achieves the best in this world and achieves the best in the hereafter. For this, he sends revelations in every age, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear in Surah Al-Raj, chapter 13, verse number 38, for every ajal, he has sent a book, revelation. And he sends messengers in every, to every people, to every nation. Surah Nahal mentions this in Surah uh, Nahal chapter 16, verse number 36. That we have sent messengers to every ummah, to every people, an-i'budullah, saying, worship Allah alone. All the prophets that came before Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be on him, were for that period of time and for those people. But Prophet Muhammad, <coughs> peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, he was the last and final messenger for whole of humanity until eternity. And that's the reason we believe that the messengers and prophets, many of them who came before Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, prophesied the coming of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And that's the reason we find in the world scriptures, there are instances, references, which point out to the coming of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. We will deal in the subject by seeing the references from the Hindu scriptures, from the Buddhist scriptures, and from the Parsi scriptures, the Atharvedas and Bhavishya Purana. And finally, we will touch briefly certain verses from the Old Testament and the New Testament, the biblical scripture. To start with it, the Hindus, they have many scriptures, many religious scriptures. They do not have just one scripture. They have number of scriptures, endless number of scriptures. So if we categorize, there are Puranas, there are Vedas, 
There are Upanishads, Itihasas, several scriptures. Among the Puranas, there is one Purana named by Bhavishya Purana. The word Bhavishya itself means speaking about future. Bhavishya means speaking about future. And in this Bhavishya Purana, written by Maharishi Vyas, and among the Hindus, Maharishi Vyas happens to be the person who has taken the incarnation of the literary aspect of God Almighty. As the Hindus, they believe that God incarnates even religious scholars and heroes, they become God, and they have that particular conception that God Almighty takes human form. So they attribute Maharishi Vyas, who has written this particular scripture, and he has written many such script, script, uh, scriptures, like Bhavishya Puranas, Mahabharata, Ramayana, several ones, he is considered to be the literary incarnation of God Almighty. And in this Bhavishya Purana, in Parv 3, Khand 3, Adhyay 3, and Shlokas from 5 to 8, it mentions that a Malecha, a spiritual teacher, speaking a foreign language, the word Malecha means a spiritual teacher <coughs> speaking a foreign language, he will arise, he will appear with his companions <coughs> and his name will be Muhammad. Can you imagine? In the text, you have the name Muhammad, a spiritual teacher, a Malecha. He will arise with his companions and his name will be Muhammad. And he will kill by joining forces the devil, and he will be safe from his Malecha opponents. He will be safe from his Malecha opponents. There are clear-cut indications in these few lines that there is prophecy about Prophet Muhammad in several instances. The first, the name Muhammad is mentioned. The name Muhammad is mentioned. Secondly, the word Maruthal in the Sanskrit text is mentioned, which indicates a desert tract land, indicating a desert land, which indicates Arabia. Third, it indicates that he will be with a group of companions. And alhamdulillah, in the history of all prophethood, the companions of Prophet Muhammad sallam, is indicated. He will enjoin force and kill the devil. And we know, before the coming of Prophet Muhammad sallam, the days were known as Ayyamul Jahiliya, the days of ignorance. And Prophet Muhammad sallam, did abolish idol worship, did go against all the evil practices, and he reformed the complete society. And he will be safe from the Malaysia opponents. Though he was alone, he came, he joined for uh, the Sahabas, they joined, and most of them, they were enemies, they were against, but yet, alhamdulillah, he was saved from the Malaysia opponents. This clearly indicates the prophecy mentioned in the Bhavishya Purana. The same Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khand 3, Chapter 3, verses from 10 to 27, speaks again about the coming of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Here, it says that the people of Arabia, they have spoiled, or the people of Arabia, the dweller of Arabia, the Malechas, they have spoiled the land of Arya Dharma. Arya Dharma means the religion of truth. They have spoiled the place of Arya Dharma. No good practices are found in this place. And there is a dream mentioned in this particular text that in an angelic disposition, a person, he reveals that a spiritual teacher by the name of Muhammad, 
he will bring, he will be busy in bringing the pishachas to the right path. He will be busy in bringing the pishachas, the ones who are away from the truth, towards the right path. Pishachas mean one who is away from the truth. And I will enforce the creed of the meat eaters. I will enforce the creed of the meat eaters. And the followers will be circumcised. The followers will be circumcised. They will not have the tail on their head. As we know the Hindus, they, the religious ones, those who are sadhus, those who uh, practice their religion seriously, they shave off their head except a portion just top of it, remain, uh, leaving it, so it is a form of a tail on their head, and they call it shendi or churki, whatever it is. And they have different explanation. They have very high regard to this particular thing. Once I happened to ask a person who was practicing this, I said that what is the significance, and he scientifically gave the answer that it serves like an antenna. The Hindus, they practice this uh, ritual of keeping tail on their head that is known as shendi or churki. And this particular prophecy says that they will not have these followers, my followers, they will not have this particular shendi tail on their head, but they will sport beard. They will sport beard announcing a revolution by announcing the azan, the call of prayer that we know. They will not have the unlawful things, but they will have the lawful things except swine. And they will, pu they will be purified through wars. They will be purified through wars, and they will be known because of their struggle towards truth to abolish falsehood, as we know, Muslims. And they will be prevailing throughout the world. Now, in this particular text from Shloka 10 to 27, we have several such things which clearly indicates that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is clearly mentioned in the particular. His companions, again, his, his men, they are mentioned. So, no other community, no other people other than Islam, followers of Islam, is indicated in this reference. Again, if you look other category of the scripture from the Hindus, in the Vedic scriptures, in the Atharva Veda, there is a section known as Kuntap Sukta. Kuntap means the hidden glands in the abdomen. Kuntap, according to the scholars, are the text which have hidden meanings, prophecies, and these prophecies cannot be understood. So many scholars among the Hindus, they do not have the translation of this Kuntap Sukta, seeing that this cannot be understood, the meanings are ambiguous, you know, nobody can follow, so do, they do not translate it. But certain scholars like Bloomfield, Raj Grafit, Ram Khejakaran, they have translated this Kuntap Sukta, and Kuntap Sukta, when you analyze the meaning, Kuntap means the consuming of the miseries and troubles. Consuming of the miseries and troubles. If you consume the misery and troubles, remaining, what remains is peace. And peace is the translation of Islam. Islam means peace. Secondly, the hidden meaning, again, because the meaning was not known, in future it was uh, expected to be known, therefore it is a prophecy. Third, kuntap also means, because it is the navel of the, ab uh, navel abdo of the abdomen, it is the center of the world, navel of the world, that is the center of the world, and Makkah happens to be the center of the world. Makkah happens to be the center of the world. Now, when we see 
this particular text from Kuttap Sukta, book number 20, chapter number 127, verses 1, 2, 3, several of them. The first verse or shloka, it says, He is Narashansa. He is Kaurama. And he will be saved from the 60,090 enemies. He is Narashansa. He is Kaurama. And he will be saved from 60,090 enemies. Now, what does the word Narashansa mean? Narashansa, according to Sanskrit, it means one praiseworthy. One who is praiseworthy. When you translate the meaning into Arabic, it is Muhammad. <laughs> Muhammad means one who is praiseworthy. Narashansa clearly means that he is praiseworthy and it refers to Prophet Muhammad. He is Kaurama. Kaurama means an immigrant who migrated, who did hijra, an immigrant. And Prophet Sallallahu did migrate from Makkah to Medina. And he will be saved from 60,090 opponents. And we believe, according to history, Islamic history, we know the population of Makkah was 60,000 at that time. This is the first verse of this particular chapter, chapter number 127. The second verse says that he will not be, he will be a, not be, uh, he will be camel riding Rishi. He will be camel riding Rishi. Now, according to Hindu scriptures, the Rishis of India, they are not supposed or they are prevented and prohibited from riding camel. According to Manusmriti, chapter 25, verse number 202, and according to Sacred Book of East, volume number 25, page number 472, it mentions that the Indian rishis, they are prohibited from riding camel, they are an ass, they are prohibited from riding camel and ass. So if this particular text says that this prophet, this rishi, will be a camel riding rishi, that it has to be, it has to indicate taking all the four verses which is in context to refer to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Third verse, it says that he will be given 10 chaplets, 100 coins, and 10,000 cows. Scholars, they interpret that 10 chaplets are the 10 Sahabas Ashra Mubashara who were given the glad tidings in this world of the Akhra that they, that they will be successful. The 10,000, they refer, or 100 coins, they refer to the Sahaba, the early Sahabas who are very close to Prophet Muhammad The 10,000, they refer to those Sahabas who came or who migrated with Prophet Muhammad uh, who came back in Fateh Makkah uh, with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after migration. So again, all these attributes and inferences refer to the coming uh, prophecy of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The fourth verse, it says that he is Yesh Rabb, one who glorifies, one who is glorified. Yeshe Rabb. Again, the word Rabb, one who glorifies, if you translate in Arabic, it in means Ahmad. Ahmad is another name of Prophet Muhammad. So, all the four verses of this particular text, chapter 127 of Atharva Veda, Kuntap Sukta, book number 20, indicates the coming of Prophet Muhammad. Again, the other text, time will not permit to cover all the Vedic references, but I will just attempt one more in Atharva Veda, book number 20, chapter number 21, verse number 6, where it says the, and describes the battle of allies. It says 
the brave people they drink the bravery they are gladdened with the songs sung on the battlefield and without any fight they render vanquish the enemies 10000 enemies the enemy of the praying one the enemy of the adoring one this speaks about the battle of allies where muslims mu'mins believers followers of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam sahabas they won the battle battle of allies ahzab without actual fighting and this is mentioned in surah al ahzab chapter number 33 verse number 22 that walamma ra al mu'minun al ahzaba when the believers they saw the confederates the forces when they saw the forces they said qalu hada wa'dana allah wa'dana allah rasuluhu this is indeed the promise the what allah and his rasul has given wa sadaq allah rasuluhu and allah's and rasul's promise was true and it whatever they said it was true and it proceeds wa ma zadahum al and nothing increased but illa imanan wa taslima their iman their faith and peace and serenity this particular battle of allies is mentioned in the athar veda book 20 chapter number 21 verse number 6 the other references are there in athar veda book 20 chapter number 21 verse number 9 which speaks about the uh, victory of um, fateh makka the other reference from samveda it speaks about that he is um, the one who is promised as sushrama which also when we translate in sanskrit it means the praiseworthy meaning muhammad the word ahmad again is also uh, mentioned with uh, by name the word ahmad is there that he will be acquiring the knowledge of uh, eternal law from his master so all these references from the athar veda indicates that prophecy of prophet muhammad is very clear the other references from other scriptures from for example buddhist scriptures in buddhist scriptures almost all the buddhist scriptures a very standard prophecy of a buddha after the present buddha which is there is prophesied for instance in chikanya the sansat d3 reference 76 it is mentioned that there will arise a buddha named maitriya the supreme one the enlightened one endowed with wisdom in conduct endowed with wisdom in conduct the supreme one the maitri one and i the present buddha is with the followers in hundreds but that buddha after me he will be having the followers in thousands his religion his teaching will be amazing and glorious in its beginning glorious in its climax glorious in its goal another reference from sacred book of east volume number 35 it mentions in the buddhist scripture that a buddha buddha is a person who is an enlightened one the word buddha means the one who is enlightened here the present buddha in this particular reference says that people should not think that i am the buddha only on whom is dependent the teaching and leadership i am not the only buddha on whom is dependent the teaching and leadership but after me there will be another buddha who will have thousand of his companions as i have in hundreds this particular text that he will have in thousands i will i have in hundreds is repeated in several buddhist scriptures in gospel of uh, buddha by carcas page number 217 and 218 there is a conversation between ananda and the present buddha at that time 
and the conversation reveals that the Ananda, a student, he questions, he uh, puts he qu queries about a coming Buddha, that if you pass away, who will be after you, who will teach us, who will guide us? So this Buddha repeats the, all those things that I'm not the only Buddha after me. Another Buddha will come. I am the one who, who is with 100 uh, followers, and, but he will have in thousands. So he says, how we will recognize that Buddha? So uh, present Buddha, he says that he will be named, he will be known as Maitreya. Maitreya is also a term which indicates to Prophet Muhammad because it means compassionate, lovely, merciful, brotherhood. Various terminologies are given to Maitreya. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu definitely in one word, he was a mercy to all creatures as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21, verse number 107. وَمَا أَرْسَلَّاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have not sent thee, but as a mercy to all creatures. Prophet Muhammad was a mercy to all creatures. In the Parsi scriptures, in Zend Avesta, Zend Yasht, chapter number 28, verse number 129, it speaks about Sao Shant, according to Hastin Encyclopedia, is the me meaning one who is praiseworthy. Sao Shant, one who is praiseworthy. And praiseworthy, we know, is the name in Arabic of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muhammad is the meaning. So even in Parsi scriptures, Buddhist scriptures, in Hindu scriptures, we find clear-cut prophecy of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We already know there are several prophecies from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. As we know, the Old Testament prophecy from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 18 and 19. Alhamdulillah, it is already famous through the lectures and the booklets and the talks given by Ahmad Didad and other speakers. Isaiah chapter 29, verse number 12, it speaks about the revelation that was re received through the angel Gabriel the first time to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said, uh, when angel said, Iqra, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied, Ma'ana biqarin, Iqra, Ma'ana biqarin, three times. This particular reference in Isaiah chapter 29, verse number 12, Ma'ana biqarin, I am not learned, is repeated there that when the book is written, I pray thee read, and he said, I am not learned. In the New Testament, we know there are very clear cut indications where Prophet Jesus, peace upon him, also prophesied the coming of Prophet Muhammad. <laughs> Prophet Jesus, in Gospel according to John, chapter number 16, verse number 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I should go away. If I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I go, I will send him unto you. Now here, there is a very clear, clear cut reference of coming of a comforter after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu after Prophet Jesus. Now we Muslims, we say that this comforter refers to Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be on him. The Christians, they say, that this is not for prophet or any prophet. This refers to Holy Spirit. This refers to Holy Spirit. If we analyze the reference, the quotation, it says that I must go away, then the comforter will come. This is the condition given. Whereas if you refer that this refers to Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit was, was already present with Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit was already present before the, any other person to come, he was present with John the Baptist. Holy Spirit was present with Elizabeth. Holy Spirit was present with Jesus Christ is upon him. In John chapter 20, verse number 21, he says, it's in present tense, receive ye the Holy Spirit. So to understand 
that Jesus Christ, uh, this particular reference, quotation refers to Holy Spirit, it is just impossible. And if we analyze the Greek word paraclete, parakletos, it refers that it is more pointing towards a person like Muhammad, person like uh, uh, a prophet like Jesus, peace upon him. And the word Muhammad can be concluded with this particular word used in, as in form of paraclete or paracletos. The same chapter, chapter number 16, verses from 12 to 14, again repeats the prophecy of a coming prophet. It says, how wait, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. He will uh, glorify me. Now this prophecy again says that somebody is coming after Jesus Christ is upon him. Now the Christian world again say that this refers to Holy Spirit. What we argue and analyze that if the Christian world they believe that the Holy Spirit is the third person of Trinity because the Christians, they believe, if they believe in Holy Spirit, they believe that Holy Spirit is the third person of Trinity. They believe that God is the Father, Son is the uh, uh, God, uh, God Almighty, Father is God Almighty, Son is God Almighty, and Holy Spirit is also God Almighty. So if Holy Spirit is God Almighty, now if you understand and refer with this understanding this particular verse and read this, he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. If you understand for God, for Holy Spirit, how can you comprehend, how can you come to this conclusion that God Almighty will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. This is impossible and incompatible with the understanding for Holy Spirit because you Christians believe that Holy Spirit is God and the reference clearly says that he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. It has to refer to another prophet besides prophet Jesus peace upon him. And if you analyze the root words, the original words in the Greek which is used for hearing and speaking, it is lelio and echo referring to speaking organ and hearing organ and it has to refer to a man like Jesus Christ is upon him. So we conclude that it is a reference to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu There are several references for detail. We can refer the booklets written on the subject Muhammad in Bible, what, what the Bible says about Muhammad, Muhammad Sallallahu the natural successor to Christ several books are written and a video program also by Dr. Zakir Naik on the very subject Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in World Scriptures. In detail we will have the references of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in various world religious scriptures. But point to be noted is that Prophet Muhammad who is the messenger to whole of humanity but unknown to most of us. Most of, human, most of the population of humankind is still unaware and unknown with the message brought by Prophet Muhammad And 1400 years ago, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in Surah Saba, chapter number 34, verse number 28, وَمَا ka إِلَّا كَافَتِ لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا that we have not sent thee, but as a messenger for all mankind, whole of humanity, as a bashiram, as a giver of glad tiding, as a warner, but most of, most of the mankind still do not know. They still do not know. 1400 years ago, this message this particular ayah was very much compatible. Today, what we know, again, the condition, the state is same. It is our duty 
it is our responsibility to convey, to introduce the message brought by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is the message for whole of humanity. It is our duty to convey it to them all. With this, I conclude with the reference which I started from the Quran in Furut, from Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 40, where it says, Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahdim mirjalikum that Muhammad is not the father of your, any of your men, walakin Rasulullah, but he is the messenger of Allah, wa khataman nabiin, and he is the seal of all the all the prophets. Wa akhru dawana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Dr. Zakir has also authored a number of books and is a regular feature on various television channels broadcast in more than one countries. Without much ado, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Zakir Naim. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahbi ajmain. Amma abad. Auzu billahi minish shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Kul in kana abaukum. Wa abnaukum. Wa ikhwanukum. Wa azwajukum. Wa ashiratukum. Wa amwalu niktaraftu muha. Wa tidaratun takshawna kasadaha. Wa masakinu tarzawnaha. Ahabba ilaykum min allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi. فتربصوا حتى يأتي الله بأمره والله لا هذا لكم الفاسقين رب شو هلي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لساني يفكه كولي. The respected chairperson, Mr. Muhammad Hashim, Dr. Sheep Syed, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on with you. In today's evening symposium on the legacy of the prophets, we just heard a very good talk by my colleague, Dr. Shweb Sayyid, on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in the various world religious scriptures. And towards the end of his talk, he mentioned to us, that it's the duty of every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to those who are unaware of it. That is Dawah. And from there I continue, and I give my presentation on the topic, the Muslim's choice, Dawah or destruction. Before we dwell into the topic, let us first understand what is the meaning of the Arabic word Dawah. Many of us who are aware of the Hindi language or Urdu language or those who come from the Indian subcontinent, we know the meaning of the word Dawat. The moment we hear the word Dawat, we start thinking of a lunch party or dinner party. Dawa or Dawat does not mean a lunch party or dinner party. Dawa or Dawat means an invitation. It means a call. And today, we will not be speaking about an invitation to a lunch party or dinner party. We'll be speaking about Dawatul Islam, an invitation to Islam. And an invitation can only be given to an outsider. That's why Dawatul Islam, the invitation to Islam, can only be given to a non-Muslim. Inviting him towards the fold of Islam. When a Muslim speaks to another Muslim, talking to him about Islam, giving him more information about Islam, the more appropriate Arabic word is Islah, which means to repair, which means to improve. And Dawah is more appropriately used when a Muslim speaks to a non-Muslim, inviting him towards Islam. So Dawah is the Arabic word which is commonly used both while speaking to Muslim and non-Muslim, though it's not wrong. But the more appropriate word when a Muslim speaks to another Muslim about Islam is Isla. 
And when we speak about Islam to non-Muslim, the more appropriate Arabic word is da'wah, to invite. <clears throat> I started my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran, from Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, which happens to be one of the most militant surah of the glorious Quran. Why do I say that Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, happens to be one of the most militant surah of the Quran. The reason is because it is the only surah, it is the only chapter in the glorious Quran which does not begin with the beautiful formula Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Otherwise, every chapter, every surah of the glorious Quran begins with the formula Bismillah Rahman Rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. For example, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Sorry, class. Before that comes, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Then it starts, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul a'uzu bi rabbil falah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul a'uzu bi rabbil nas. Every surah, every chapter of the glorious Quran begins with the formula, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. But, in the beginning of Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim not there. Because it is one of the most militant surah of the Quran. For example, if you are walking along with your mother, suppose the Muslim brother is walking along with his mother, or along with his wife, down the streets of Birmingham. And suppose a hooligan, suppose a ruffian, comes and snatches the handbag of your mother or handbag of your wife, and he runs away. What will you do? What will you do? But naturally chase him. And the moment you catch up with him, you will not say, Assalamu alaikum, may peace be on you. You will not say, Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. You will get down to the subject directly. Hey, mister, give the handbag, I'll break your neck. Hey, mister, give the handbag, I'll break your arm. You will get down to the subject directly. Bismillah is uncalled for. Similarly, if you read Surah Tawbah, Surah number 9, the first few verses, it speaks about a peace treaty between the mushriks of Makkah and the Muslims. And this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the mushriks of Makkah. And by the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5, He is giving the mushriks of Makkah a warning. And He tells them, You put things straight in four months' time, otherwise a declaration of war. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving an ultimatum. Bismillah is uncalled for. That's the reason some of the scholars say that this is one of the most militant surah of the Quran and does not begin with the formula Bismillah rahman rahim But by the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 24, the ayah, I quoted in the beginning of my talk, he is addressing us Muslims. Now, we Muslims, we are in the firing line. Now, we Muslims, we are in the firing line. And he says, the ayah I decided in the beginning of my talk, Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24, it says, Kul in kana abaukum, say whether it be for your fathers, wa abnaukum, or your sons, wa ikhwanukum, or your brothers, wa azwajukum, or your spouses, your husbands or wives, wa ashiratukum, or your relatives. Allah is asking, what are your considerations? Are they your fathers? Are they your sons? Are they your brothers? Are they your spouses? Your husbands or wives? Are they your relatives? And Allah continues. The wealth you have amassed. The business in which you deal. The house in which you live. Allah is asking, what are your considerations? Are they your fathers? Your sons, your brothers, your spouses, your relatives, the wealth you have amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live. Allah is asking, what are your considerations? And Allah continues. Ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabili. If you love all these things more than Allah, His Rasul, and doing jihad, striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, Fatarabbasu, you wait. 
and we Muslims, we are waiting, sitting on our backside doing nothing. What does Allah mean when he says, فَتَرَبَّصُ When he says, wait, what does he mean? For example, if in a school, a senior student, he bullies a junior student. And the junior student says, wait till I get my elder brother. And his elder brother happens to be one of the biggest hooligan of that area. So when the junior student tells the elder student, the senior student, wait, what he's actually telling him is that you buzz off. You better vanish from here. You better improve, otherwise you will be taught a lesson. Similarly, Allah tells us, فَتَرَبَّسُوا حَتَّى يَعْتِيَ اللَّهِ بِأَمْرِ وَاللَّهُ لَهَذُكُمْ الْفَاسِقِينَ Wait until Allah brings his decision unto you. Wait until Allah brings his destruction unto you. وَاللَّهُ لَهَذُكُمْ الْفَاسِقِينَ And Allah guides not the fasik people. Allah is telling that if you love all these eight things, your father, your sons, your brothers, your spouses, your relatives, the wealth you have amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live, if you love all these eight things more than Allah, His Rasul, and doing jihad, striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, فَتَرَبَّسُوا Wait, hatta يَأْتِيَ Allah bi'amri Until Allah brings His destruction to you. وَاللَّهُ لَا ذُكُمْ الْفَاسِقِينَ And Allah guides not the fasik people, the perverted transgressors. Allah says in Surah Muhammad, chapter number 47, verse number 38, Allah says, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْلِ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ سُمَّا لَيْكُنَ مَسَالَكُمْ If you do not do your job, if you turn away from Allah's path, Allah will substitute in your place another people, سُمَّا لَيْكُنَ مَسَالَكُمْ And they will not be like you. Allah says, if you turn away from His path, if you do not do your job, if you do not do your duty, Yes, Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa lakinum salakum, and they will not be like you. And we find in the history that Allah has His way. The people who you look down upon the most, Allah brings them out from the dust and makes them sit on your head. And we find the example, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Jummah, chapter number 62, verse number 5. The Mosaic law was given to the Jews, but they were like donkeys on whom tomes, tons of books were kept and they understood not. The Jews thought that they were the chosen people and they looked down upon the Arabs. They did not convey the message. They did not follow the instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah brings the people who they looked down upon. Before the Quran was revealed, in the days of Arab, it was called Ayyamul Jahiliya, the days of ignorance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his kalam, the glorious Quran, he makes these people who are in dust, he makes them sit on the head. Allah has his way. So Allah tells you, if you do not do your job, Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa lak nam salakum, and they will not be like you. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people in the world for mankind. Allah is calling us خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ The best of people. Allah is giving us an honor. And there is no honor without responsibility. Whenever there is honor, it is always attached with responsibility. For example, in a school, the principal has got more honor than a teacher. A teacher has got more honor than a clerk. There is no honor without responsibility. Therefore, along with the honor, there is responsibility. The principal has got more responsibility than a teacher. The teacher has got more responsibility than the clerk. There is no honor without responsibility. When Allah is giving us honor in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, Saying, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people you all for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor, calling us a khaira ummah. Don't you think we have a responsibility? The reply is given in the same verse. And the verse continues. Ta'muruna bil ma'arufi wa tanhawna anil munkar. Wa tu'minuna billah. Because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong. And we believe in Allah. 
Allah is calling us khair ummah because we are supposed to enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. If we do not enjoy what is good, if we do not forbid what is wrong, we aren't fit to be called as khair ummah. We aren't fit to be called as Muslims. It's the duty of every Muslim that should convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 143, that he has made us an ummah a middle most community, so that we may be a witness over the nations and the messenger will be a witness over us. We Muslims, when anyone asks us, that who do you love the most in this world? And I'd like to ask the same question. Who do you love the most in this world? Who do you love the most? Number one, who do you love maximum more than anyone? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who do you love the most? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah. You ask any Muslim and he will tell you the maximum he loves anyone, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than our mother, more than our father, more than our wife. Do we or not? Yes or no? MashaAllah. We Muslims, we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than our mother, more than our father, more than our wives, more than our children. Alhamdulillah. I would like to ask you a simple question. Let's suppose when you have gone away from your home, I like to ask the Muslim brothers, that when you have gone away from home, suppose your neighbor, he abuses, uses foul language against your mother. Without any reason, he abuses your mother, he uses foul language against your mother, and when you come back home in the evening, and when you come to know that your neighbor, without any rhyme or reason, he has abused your mother, he has used foul language against your mother, what will you do? What will you do? What will you do? What will you do? Shoot him. Mashallah, what will you do? Punch him. What will you do? Smile. What will you do? If someone abuses a mother unnecessarily, what will you do? Kill him. Mashallah, one person wants to shoot him, one person wants to punch him, the other brother wants to kill him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, Verse number 88-92, Allah says, وَقَالُوا تَقَذُ الرَّحْمَانُ وَرَدَهُ They say that Allah most gracious has begotten a son. لَقَدْ جِيتُ مَشَيَّنْ إِدَّا Indeed, they have put forth a thing most monstrous. If anyone says that Allah has begotten a son, Allah says it is the biggest abuse you can give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the most heinous thing you can say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah continues, وَقَالُوا تَقَذُ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدَا لَقَدْ جِيتُ مُشَيَّنْ إِدَّا تَقَذُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَتَفَتَّنَّا مِنُّ As though the skies are ready to burst. وَتَنِشَقُ الْأَرْضُ The earth to split asunder. وَتَخِرُّ الْجِبَالُ حَدَّا And the mountains to fall down to utter ruin. If anyone says that Allah has begotten a son, if the sky had feelings, the sky would have burst open. The earth would have split open. The mountains would have fallen down to utter ruin. But to us Muslims, Believe me, it makes no difference. We say we love Allah more than our mother, more than our father, more than our children, more than our wife. We say it, but do we actually mean it? Every day, our non-Muslim friends, our non-Muslim colleagues, they are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every day, our Christian friends, our Christian colleagues, our Hindu friends, our Hindu colleagues, every day in schools, in colleges, in universities, in workplaces, in business places, they are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can't even open our mouth. We say we love Allah more than our mother, more than our father, more than our wife. If someone abuses our mother, you want to shoot him. You want to punch him. You want to kill him. You say you love Allah more than everyone in the world. Our friends, our colleagues, our acquaintances, Every day they are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we Muslims can't even open our mouth. I don't want to kill him. I don't want to punch him. I don't want to shoot him. At least open your mouth. You say you love Allah more than a mother, more than a father. Do you actually mean it? 
Do you mean it? Do we actually mean it when we say that? Every day you look around us, there is an ocean of shirk around us. And Allah is crying in the Quran that if anyone says Allah has begotten a son, it is the biggest abuse you can give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the sky had feelings, the sky would have burst open. The earth would have split open. The mountains would have fallen down to utter ruin. And we Muslims can't even open our mouth. It's a shame on us. It's a shame on us. Allah is crying in the Quran and saying that this is the biggest abuse you can give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And leave aside we Muslims conveying the message to non-Muslims. Leave aside we correcting them not to do shirk. Many of us, we become party to them. And now this is, now is the season of Christmas. Many of us Muslim brothers, they go and wish the Christian, they wish Merry Christmas. Do you know what you are doing? When you are wishing a Christian Merry Christmas, what are you doing? You are giving shahada, nauz billah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has begotten a son on the 25th of December. You are giving shahada. No, you know, they are friends. So Merry Christmas. Leave aside you correcting them. You are becoming party to the shirk. You are giving shahada that nauz billah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has begotten a son on the 25th of December. Because the Christians believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, they consider nauz billah, that he is the begotten son of God. He is God Almighty himself, that he was born on the 25th of December. Leave aside correcting them, you are becoming party to them. And many a times, when these Hindus have the festival, and since many Indian Hindus are also here, they have this festival which is very common known as Ganesh Chaturthi. Ganpati. Do you have it here? Ganpati? In Leicester. In Birmingham, they don't have. No one celebrates. Maybe I know more about you, more about Birmingham than you. Possible. Though I'm just a traveler, I've come only a few times to Birmingham, maybe six, seven times. But maybe I know Birmingham better than you. At least as far as Hindu festivals are concerned. They have this festival called as Ganpati Ganesh Chaturthi. And they have it here also. I know many Hindus. And that information I get from the Muslim brothers here. Many a times when Muslims are called, many of us Muslims go. And they go for the festival. And there they give you prasad. Do you know what prasad is? Do you know prasad? Prasad is an offering which they give on this idol. Idol God Ganesh. An offering of food which they give on this idol. And when they give to the Muslims, many of us Muslims, they know very well. Most of us know eating prasad is haram because in no less than four different places the Quran says in Surah Bakhra, chapter number two, verse number 173, in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number three, in Surah Anam, chapter number six, verse number 145, and Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 115, Hurrimat alaykumul maitu tu waddam wa rahmul kanzeer, wa ma'uhilla li gairilla bi, forbidden for you for food are huh? dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah is taken. We know very well Eating any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken is haram and prasad is haram. But when our Hindu friend offers us prasad, how can we break his heart? So what do we do? We say Bismillah and have it. <laughs> tomorrow, you'll say Bismillah and have alcohol. Day after tomorrow, you'll say Bismillah and have pork. What's happened to the Muslim Ummah? We can't even open our mouth. We are afraid to open our mouth. Because we don't want to hurt our friend. We prefer keeping the friendship of the non-Muslim friend rather than the friendship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who we say, we claim in inverted commas that we love the maximum in this world. It is so easy. The only thing you have to do is open your mouth. Suppose someone invites me for this festival of Ganpati. Only thing you have to do is ask him a simple question. Who is this Ganesh? So a Hindu friend will tell you that this Ganesh is our God who is the son of Lord Shiva. And he'll tell you the story that one day when the wife of Lord Shiva, Parvati, she has a tomb and Lord Shiva goes on an expedition. So Parvati takes out dirt from the body and she creates a son and calls it Ganesh and tells the son, you stay at the entrance of the, go 
of the house and do not allow anyone to come in. So after a long time, when the Shiva, when he comes back to his home, when he's about to enter his house, this boy, he stops him at the door and says, do not enter the door, do not enter the house. My mother, she is resting. So Shiva is infuriated. Who is this young lad trying to stop me from entering my own home? So he chops off his head. This is the story told to you by a Hindu friend. You have to ask a Hindu friend, your almighty God cannot recognize his own son. How will he recognize me when I'm in trouble? <laughs> he cannot recognize his own son and chops off the head. How will he recognize me when I'm in trouble? And the story continues. The head was chopped off so far that almighty God could not get it back. So he tells the people that the first animal you come across, you chop off there of the animal and get it to me. And the first animal they come across is the elephant and they chop off there of the elephant and they grow to Lord Shiva and Lord Shiva fixes on the body of his son and then you have Ganesh, an elephant boy. So you ask your friend, is this the God you believe? He says, Janathan Azakir, forget it. Don't have it. This is all mythology. You, you tell him, but I want to have the prasad. You prove to me Ganesh is God and I'll have it. Because Quran says I can have the food on which God's name is taken. Someone else beside God, I can't. You, he said, Janetena, this is my thought. You forget it. Now he's running away from you and you have to follow him. You prove to me I want to have the prasad. You prove to me Ganesh is God. I'll have it. It is so easy. You don't have to abuse him. You don't have to insult him. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16. Verse 108, revile not those people, abuse not those people who worship God besides Allah, lest in their ignorance they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't have to abuse them. Only thing you have to ask a question, who is this Ganesh? Ask an innocent question and a job is done. They will do the rest for you. But we Muslims are afraid to open our mouth. We can't even correct them. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 120, وَلَن تَرْدَى يَنْكَ الْيَهُدُ وَلَن نَسَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِيُوا مِلَّتِهُمْ The Jews and the Christians, they will never be satisfied until you follow their brand of religion. Allah says, the Jews and the Christians, they will never be satisfied until you follow their brand of religion. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 111, وَقَالُوا لَيَتْ Allah says, that they say, the Jews and the Christian, that you shall never enter Jannah unless you become a Jew or a Christian. They say that you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah unless you become a Jew or a Christian. You Muslims, with all your piety, with your Hajj, with your fasting, with your Salah, with the mark on your forehead, you shall never enter Jannah unless you become a Jew or a Christian. Allah says, Tilka amani juhum. This is the wishful thinking. Bakwas e bakwas. Vain desires. Cool. Tell them. Hatu buna nukum. Produce your proof. In kuntum sadikin. But if you're truthful. Allah says, When anyone makes a tall claim, when anyone makes a tall exaggerated claim, tell them, Kul hatu buna nukum. Produce your proof. In kuntum sadikin, but if you're truthful. And these Christian missionaries, they have produced the proof. Their Burhan. Their Holy Bible in no less than 2,000 different languages. They say, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. What do we have to do? Do we have to swallow the Bible hook, line and sinker? What do we have to do? When someone shows you his proof, what do we do? We have to analyze the proof, whether it's right or wrong. When someone shows you the identity card, what do you do? You check up whether it is right or wrong. Leave aside we analyzing their Buran. These Christian missionaries, they come knocking at a door and they are using our Buran against us. These Christian missionaries throughout the world, hundreds and thousands of them, they are raising the dust and they are using our Buran, our Quran against us. They come knocking at the Muslims' door and they ask us a simple question. That isn't it mentioned in the Quran that Bible is the word of God? And most of us will say, yes. Then there's the next question. Then why don't you follow the Bible? And we have got no reply. They ask the next question. That how many times is your last and final prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, mentioned by name in the Quran? And if you know, you will say, he is mentioned five times. They ask the next question. How many times is Jesus Christ peace be upon him, mentioned by name in the Quran? 
if you don't know, they will tell you, he is mentioned 25 times. And if you check up there, right? Then they ask the following question. Who is greater? A person who is mentioned 25 times by name in the Quran is greater or a person who is mentioned 5 times by name in the Quran is greater? Who is greater? A person who is mentioned 25 times the 5 times. Who is greater? Who is greater? 25 times the 5 times. Who is greater? A person who is mentioned 25 times by name or 5 times by name? They ask you the question but they don't give you the reply. They let your mind think. There is the next question. That the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did he have a mother and father? We said, yes, he had a mother and father. Did Jesus Christ peace be upon him? Did he have mother and father? And we have to agree that he had a mother, but he had no father. So who's greater? A person who has a father is greater or a person who does not have a father is greater? Who's greater? A person who has a father is greater or a person who does not have a father is greater? Who's greater? Who's greater? A person who has a father is greater or a person who doesn't have a father is greater? Who's greater? A person who does not have a father is greater. They don't give you the answer. They let your mind think. They come knocking at our doors. They are using us Muslims like punching bags, like dough mats, and we can't even open our mouth. There's the next question. That your Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did he do any miracles? We say, yes, he did several miracles. Do you know of any miracle in which he gave life to the dead? And we have to agree. There is no verse in the Quran. There is no authentic hadith which says that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave life to the dead. They ask the next question. Did Jesus Christ peace be upon him? Did he give life to the dead? And we have to agree. The Quran mentions, Bismillah, wake up in the name of Allah. Yes, he gave life to the dead. So who is greater? A person who can give life to the dead is greater or a person who cannot give life to the dead is greater? Who's greater? A person who can give life to the dead is greater or a person who cannot give life to the dead is greater? They ask the question, but they don't give you the reply. They ask the next question. Your Prophet Muhammad is he physically dead or alive? And we have to agree that physically he's dead. He's buried in Medina. Is Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, is he physically dead or alive? And we have to agree that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he has been raised up alive, as the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 158. Then there's the next question. Who's greater? A prophet whose dead is greater or a prophet whose alive is greater? They ask you the question, but they don't give you the reply. They are using us Muslims like doormats, like punching bags. You know, we have shooting practice, target practice, and we Muslims, we can't even open our mouth. It's a shame on the Muslim Ummah. It is so easy to do Dawah, it's so easy. If you read the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you way how to convey the message. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, Kul, ya ahlul kitab, say, O people of the book, Ta'alo ila qalmitin sawa'im, bayna baynakum. Come to common terms, as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. That we associate to partners with him. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fine tawalla. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. Say bear witness. Bianna Muslimun that we are Muslims bowing away to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah shows you a way how to convey the message. Ta'ala ila kalmitin sawa imbainan abainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah, that we worship them but Allah. But when we ask the Muslims, why don't you convey the message? They say, you know, inshallah, Brother Zakir, inshallah, when we have knowledge one day, we will start doing dawah. They want to become like Sheikh Ahmad Dida, they then start doing dawah. The time will never come. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Balligo anni wala aya, propagate even if you know one verse. As long as you know one verse correctly, you propagate it. Whatever you know correctly, you have to propagate it. And every Muslim, at least he knows that there's one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At least he knows the shahada. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. At least go and convey that message that there is one Allah. 
at least convey that. At least you know that the last and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam go and convey that. Whether they agree or not is a different question. At least open your mouth. If you tell them there is one Allah subhanahu wa taala, and if they ask you for proof, if you don't know, what do you do? You come home and do your homework. Today there are literatures, books, booklets, pamphlets, video cassettes, everything on your fingertips on the internet. You can also see my video cassette. Is the Quran God's word, which proves scientifically, undoubtedly, that the Quran is the word of God and the existence of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That Allah is one. Hear it, memorize it, repeat it. Then tell him, why don't you believe in the last and final messenger? If you want the proof, you can repeat the lecture with Dr. Shoaib here. Everything on your fingertips. At least open your mouth. There are some people who come and tell me, Brother Zakir, you know, there are so many of us Muslim brothers who don't know Islam. First, we will make the Muslim pakka Muslim, and then we will go and convey the message to the non-Muslim. There are a few group of Muslims who come and tell me, Brother Zakir, first we want to make the Muslim pakka Muslim, and then after we make all the Muslim pakka Muslim, all the Muslims practicing Muslims, then we will go and do dawa to the non-Muslim. I tell them this time will never come. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he himself could not convince his own relatives. He could not convince his uncle. Do you think your brother and the Prophet? Do you think your brother and the Prophet? The Prophet didn't say, "I will first make you know all my people pakka Muslim and then start doing dawa." There's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the Book of Salah, that in Medina. There were Muslims who did not come for the compulsory congregation salah, who did not come for the Juma salah in the mosque. He felt like burning their homes. That means there were Muslims in Medina who were not practicing Muslims. Yet the Prophet wrote letters to the king of Abyssinia, to the king of Syria, to the king of Egypt, asking them to accept Islam. He didn't say first tell make the Muslims pakka Muslims, practicing Muslims, and then start doing dawah to the non-Muslims. Both are equally important. And during the farewell pilgrimage, Hajjul Vida, there were about 110,000 sahabas. And when the Prophet asked them, "That did I deliver the message to you?" All of them said, "Beishak, verily you have delivered the message to us." The Prophet said, "All those who are present here, go and deliver the message to those who are not present here." And out of 110,000 sahabas, more than 100,000 sahabas were buried outside the Arab land. Doing what? Making Muslim and pakka Muslim. What were they doing? They went out and delivered the message to those who were non-Muslims. It's compulsory that every Muslim should do dawa. Even Islam is important. Both are equally important. When you meet a Muslim, do Islam. If you feel that it requires something to be corrected, when you meet a non-Muslim, do dawa. Both are equally important. But you can't say, "I will first make all the Muslim and pakka Muslim and then start doing dawa." The time will never come. And some people, they say, "That Prophet Zakir, when we speak about religion, they say many of the non-Muslims tell me that mind your own business." So I give the example. Let's suppose you have gone with your family on a hill station, and while you are talking with your wife, your young son, four years old, by the name of Ahmed, he slips away from you, and by the time you realize that he is not with you, he is already gone far away towards the edge of the cliff. You want to shout, Ahmed, be careful! But your wife cannot reach, and there you see that your son Ahmed is approaching towards the cliff. And close to the edge of the cliff is another elderly gentleman, very elderly gentleman, with his hands folded. He is admiring beauty. We want to shout, "Baza, Mister, please save my son!" But he can't hear you. That elderly gentleman, he looks at your son, and he smiles, and he continues admiring beauty. After a few seconds, your son takes one more steps. Your son, he takes one more step, and he falls over the cliff. I am asking the question: Will you? Or will you not blame that elderly gentleman? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. You'll blame him. You'll tell him, "Mister, why didn't you save my son?" He will tell you, "I was minding my own business." And he's right. He's not wrong. 
He was minding his own business. He didn't push your son. Did he push your son? No. Did he ask your son to jump? No. So how can you blame him? He's right. He was minding his own business. But yet, you will blame him. You will tell him that Allah has given you wisdom. God has given you wisdom. My son was masum. He did not know that he will die. The only thing you have to do, you didn't even have to take a step forward. Only thing you have to do was stretch your hand and my son would have been saved. Yet you will blame him. Will you or will you not? Of course. You will tell him that Allah has given you wisdom. God has given you wisdom. The only thing you have to do was stretch your hand and my son would have been saved. Similarly, on the day of judgment, these mushriks, they will blame the Muslims. That when you knew that we are going towards the hellfire, why didn't you save us? They will question you. That why didn't you save us? If anyone tells you that when you talk about religion, if any non-Muslim tells you, mind your own business, you have to reply, that's what I'm doing. It is the business of every Muslim to mind someone else's business as far as faith is concerned. So actually I'm minding my business. By doing dawah, you're minding your business. It's your business to mind other person's business as far as faith is concerned. So you have to say, brother, that's what I'm doing. I'm minding my business. Only thing you have to open your mouth. Suppose you have a neighbor who's a mushrik. And if you don't convey the message to him, and if he dies on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him that why didn't you accept Islam? He will tell you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one gave me the message. Allah will say, it's your job to find the message. Allah will put him in hell. Allah will ask you next. Did you deliver the message to your mushrik neighbor? And if you say no, you will follow him. You will follow him. It's compulsory duty of every Muslim to convey the message to the non-Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, Allah says, Wal-Asr, inna al-insana fi khusr. By the token of time, man is well in a state of loss. Except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. The minimum criteria required for any human being to go to Jannah is Iman, righteous deed, exhorting people to truth, that is doing dawah, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these four criteria are missing, under normal circumstances, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a very good Muslim. You may be offering five times salah. You may have gone for hajj. You may be fasting during the month of Ramadan. You may be giving zakat. But if you don't do dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. Only dawah is not, only dawah is not the only criteria. All four is required. Iman, righteous deed, exhorting people to truth dawah, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If anyone is missing under normal circumstances, you shall not enter Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you, that's a different question. Because Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 48, and Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive the sin of shirk. Any other sin, if he wishes, he may forgive. So under normal circumstances, doing dawah is fard to go to Jannah. If you do not do, no jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you, that's a different question. Being part-time da'i is further than every Muslim. At least part-time da'i. And Allah also says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 104, let there arise out of you a group of people, a band of people that enjoin people towards the good and forbid them from doing wrong. These are the ones who shall attain felicity. Here Allah is talking about full-time da'is. How do we have full-time doctors, full-time engineers, full-time advocates, full-time teachers? How many full-time dais do we have? How many? How many people are traveling in the world like the Christian missionaries do? Hundreds and thousands of them leaving the country, going to the other part of the country and traveling throughout the world. How many dais do we have doing that? You can count them on your fingertips. On your fingertips. At least it's a fact that you should be a part-time dai. And if you're a full-time die, Allah promises you shall attain felicity. Allah says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125, Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them 
in the ways that are best for most Christians. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a promise. Allah gives a promise in no less than three different places in the Quran. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. And Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9, Allah twice says here, Huwa allazi arsala rasulhu bilhuda. Wa ad-deen al-haq li yudhira wa ala ad-deen kulli. Wa lo qahir al-mushikoon. Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other ways of life, over all the other isms, whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Parsism, Atheism, Secularism, Materialism. Islam is destined to supersede all, kulle, overcome them all, master them all. Walau qari al mushrikun. How much the mushrik don't like it. And Allah repeats this message for the third time. In Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28 with a different ending, Allah says, Huwa allazi arsala rasooluhu bilhuda wa deen al-haq li yudhira wa ala deen kulli wa qafa billahi shayda. Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other ways of life, over all the other isms, whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Parthism, materialism, secularism, atheism, Islam is destined to supersede all, kulli, master them all, overcome them all. Waqafa billahi shayda. And enough is Allah as a witness. Allah is giving you the promise that this deen of his, this deen of Islam will prevail over all the other religions with or without you, with or without me, the rubbish that we are. Allah does not require you and me to make his deen prevail. Do you think Allah requires you and me to make his deen prevail? Allah does not require you and me. Allah is giving us an opportunity to make hay while the sun is shining. He does not require you and me to make his deen prevail. He alone is sufficient. He is giving you an opportunity to make hay while the sun is shining. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, which says, Woman asun kala mimman doil Allahi, mu amil solihon, kala inna nimna muslimi, who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says that I am a Muslim. Wakhr dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alim. Yan kal yahudu, walan nasara, hatta tatabiyu milatihum. The Jews and the Christians, they will never be satisfied until you follow their brand of religion. Uh, and a very, very enlightening uh, talk by Dr. Zakir uh, uh, Naik, you would agree. Um, we would now take questions. Uh, we now move on to the question and answer session uh, for both uh, speakers. Uh, the pattern that we would adopt uh, to take questions is that we have a speaker on both sides of the uh, podium here. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. I'm uh, Isam Ghannam. I'm a doctor like you, but I'm no way as brainy as both of you. Very enlightening. Uh, the question is for Dr. Shaib. You did actually, when you talked about, which is very nice to hear what the Hindu and uh, Bodhi said, but you spoke in a way which is like you addressing them as they are, um, as if they are uh, heavenly messages which is like if they are revelation from Allah. You like equalize them with the Torah and Injil. And in Islam, to my knowledge, is you only, the Prophet ﷺ said, Hadithu an bani Israel wa la haraj. So you tell about the, Israel, the, the prophets of Israel, obviously providing it's in agreement with the Quran and Sunnah. But I'm interested to know what made you use them as if they are equal to Torah and Injil because obviously some of us might uh, need to use them again. Jazakallah <coughs> The question posed is that what made me to equate the Hindu scriptures to Torah and Injil? Before I give the answer to this question, the biblical scripture, the Bible, is no way Torah and Injil. Torah, which we Muslims believe, is the revelation revealed to Prophet Moses with upon him. Zabur, the revelation revealed to Prophet David with upon him. Injil, revealed to Prophet Jesus with upon him. The Christians, they say that 
partly tiftora zabur and injil but we do not believe that the biblical compilation that they have from genesis to revelation is the torah that was revealed to prophet moses or zabur revealed to prophet david or injil revealed to prophet jesus peace upon him now yes it is true that according to authentic hadith we are permitted to take the israeli rawayat israeli rawayat it does not say that you can you can take from the biblical scripture it says that you can take the israeli rawayat if it is not in contradiction with the islamic sharia the reason and i am not in no way i am equating the hindu scripture with bible or bibles equating with the islamic scripture nothing like that we believe that allah subhanahu wa taala gave revelation in every period surah to raj chapter 13 verse number 38 it says likulli ajlin kitab for every ajal he has given a revelation allah subhanahu wa taala as i said not made the previous revelation to be for eternity and therefore we know and we we witness that those revelations that were revealed are not intact and preserved the revelation which was revealed as the final revelation is the quran and alhamdulillah it is preserved and intact and it will be intact till eternity till the last day now once we know that the revelations came before the truth came from allah subhanahu wa taala but this truth though it was not preserved intact did percolate and got uh, uh, permitted in other scriptures sacred scriptures religious scriptures not saying not equating it as a word of god but certain truths are there in religious scriptures of the world now the reason that i i use this is the instruction that i get from quran from the revelation that allah has revealed finally and it is there in surah al baqarah as it was quoted before from surah al baqarah chapter 2 verse number 111 wa qalu lan yadkhula al jannata illa man kana hudan aw nasara and they say in boast that none shall enter paradise unless he be a jew or christian wa qalu lan yadkhula al jannata illa man kana hudan aw nasara tilka amaniyuh these are their wishful thinking qul hatu burhanukum tell them produce their proof in kuntum sadiqin if they are truthful what we have to realize here that we have to analyze the evidences the scriptures of the other party and analyze them that what they believe and what they understand is not true and if they say that the salvation the righteousness the goal the nirvana the moksha is according to that so we have to explain to them we have to analyze and do dawa for the very of the purpose of dawa we have to explain and convey the message of islam convey the message of uh, prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that if we can prove from the scripture that prophecy of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned we should share with them not that we equate the scripture not that we accept the scripture to be authentic not that we equate those scripture as the sacred one and preserved one we do believe the revelations came before but those revelations are not intact and preserved yet these are the religious scriptures that you believe and if you believe those are the religious scriptures and authentic then this is what it is there in your scripture you are obliged to accept prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who is the last and final messenger i hope this satisfy you jazakallah khairan um in order to be equal both to the sisters and the brothers because uh, i appreciate the fact that uh, sisters may be shy not wanting to come to the mic and to be equal to the speakers as well um uh, i'm told that there's a sister who wants to come to the mic and ask the question if she can please assalamu alaikum alaikum assalam um i just wanted to know if you think it would be wise for sisters to set up a stall in a busy city center right um Okay. Uh would you Dr. Zakir will take that question. Thank you very much this is Zakla. The sister has a question that would it be advisable or right for sisters to set up a stall in a busy center? 
Busy center means a place, I believe you're talking about in the street or in a mall, something similar. Sister, as far as one-to-one -one dawa is concerned, on a personal level, having a stall means a personal level. As far as dawa is concerned, on a one-to-one -one basis, it is preferable that man does with a man, male does with a male, and a female with a female because of the hijab level. Allah will not question you if a female does not do dawa with a male or a male does not do with female. Because Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. Whenever a woman looks at a man, any brazen thought comes, she should lower her gaze. Similarly, for a man, the earlier verse, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard the modesty. That means whenever a man looks at a woman, any brazen thought comes, any unashamed thought comes, he should lower the gaze. So for this reason, for the hijab purposes, we have to realize that on a one-to-one -one basis, it is a male does to a male and a female does to a female. If female put up a stall in a gathering where exclusively ladies are there, it's very good, alhamdulillah, I would encourage you. Exclusively, for example, if you know there's a, there's a particular function where exclusive ladies are coming, maybe for any particular function or a gathering. So there, if you put up a stall, there's no problem. Otherwise, on a one-to-one -one basis, a, a male doing with a female is also not the right way, according to the Sharia, neither a female with a male, individual level. On a public level, if someone is giving a lecture, like a gent is giving a lecture, and ladies are there in the audience, there's no problem. On the video cassette, they see it's so no problem. But on a personal one-to-one -one basis, you will not be able to follow the Islamic Sharia. Because if a man talks to a girl, but natural, he cannot look down and speak. Fine. For a particular purpose, you can. But on the street, when you're on the street, and a woman comes, you, you cannot look down and speak. You have to look down and speak. You can't look eye to eye. Because eye to eye, the Islamic Sharia says you have to lower your gaze. So to maintain the Islamic hijab, it is preferable male do with male and female do with female. Hope that answers the question, sister. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, we're having uh, uh, questions come by floods. Uh, I see the brothers are queuing up. Inshallah, if we can keep to the subject and uh, uh, to keep the question as short as possible. Brother there. Asalaamu Alaikum. My name Alaykum is Salaam. Ibrah Hussain, and this question is to Dr. Zakir Naik. I have been watching your tapes on Hinduism, and the thing that surprised me is the Hindus wear the weeds around their necks, and they use tasbih canting beads in their prayer. If you look at the history also of the religious men of Hinduism, they used to move their heads left to right in prayer. My question is, nowhere in the Quran or Sunnah did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wear the weeds, no use, thus be counting beads in prayer, nor did he move his head left to right in zikr, nor did he do a congregation dua after every salah. So why are the Muslims wearing the weeds, using counting beads, moving their heads left to right in zikr, and doing congregation dua after every salah? The Prophet, uh, nor the Prophet peace be upon him, nor did the companion did any of this. So why are the Muslims doing this? To Dr. Zakir Naik. Thank you. Jazakallah. If I'm not mistaken, this question is asked by Hindu. You said on, on Hinduism. Hindus are doing. Why are the Hindus wearing the Tavis? No, no. The, Hindu, the Hindus wear Tavis, yeah. And they, do, they have this kind of counting beads, yeah? Rosary beads. Yeah, hmm? when they're in prayer. Hmm? So uh, no in the Quran, Sunnah, did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon like Muslims do, when they say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, for the counting beads, the Prophet do, didn't do this. So I can't understand the, the question. Are you talking about the Muslims are doing or what the Hindus are doing? The so why do the Hindus follow the Prophet Muhammad Why, why, no, no, why no, no. are the Muslims doing that? Why yeah, Muslims you know. are doing? Yeah. Similar, well, it's a practice of Similar Hindus. as the Hindus are doing. Yeah. That's right. So your question I understood correctly now. That the Hindus wear Tawis and wear the rosary bead, etc. Even the Muslims are doing that, even though the Prophet did not do. So why are they doing that? That's the question. Brother, as far as the Tawis that is there, I do know that it's done. There are Tawis are worn by some groups of Muslims coming from, not in India, there are in other parts of the world. And many of the Hindus also go to these dargahs, etc. And they wear the Tawis. And again, the rosary bead, it is done by the Christians, done by the Hindus also, done by certain groups of Muslims also. Though you're perfectly right that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we don't find any hadith. In fact, tying the taweez, it leads to shirk. 
Well, if you have to ask for help, you have to ask to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. If you ask to anyone else, that leads to shirk. So these things are normally have crept into the religion, though it has got no authentic source. And many of the things that have crept in is mainly because in India, if you analyze, our great-great-grandfathers, they were Hindus. Some may be having Arab blood, but most of them don't have Arab blood. Fine. So because many of us accepted Islam, our earlier great-great-grandfathers, there you find that they have changed, or when they change the religion, something which is there in our previous culture, a previous religion, something remains. So that's the reason instead of going to temple, now we are going to Darga. So these practices have stuck, which is wrong. So what we have to do, we have to convey the message to these Muslims that you don't find such practices anywhere in the Quran and the Sunnah. Certain things which is not against the Sharia. And if it's there in the culture, it can be practiced, certain things. Which is not going against the Islamic Sharia, you can practice. But there are certain things which goes against the Islamic Sharia, like wearing a tawiz, fine, and doing zikr in the way which the Prophet never did. So these things are against the Quran and Sunnah. We have to educate these Muslim brothers that if you have to do any worship, it should have, the, the worship you do should be somewhat similar, which is mentioned either in the Quran or the Sahih Hadith. What is not mentioned in the Quran and Sahih Hadith, we Muslims should not do that style. So we have to educate them, brother. Hope that's the question. Jazakallah khairan. Um, a question on behalf of the sisters uh, uh, is that, and I'll uh, uh, forward this to uh, Dr. Shuaib, is that when the issue of religion does not surface, how, would we, how should we go about making da'wah to non-Muslim friends? Uh, please give some ideas, some tips. The question posed by Fifta is that if issue of religion does not surface, in short, the person is not at all interested in religion, how to go about conveying the message of Islam to such a person. And the guidance, as repeated and mentioned by Dr. Zaki Naik in his talk from Surutul Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 64, وَقُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ Say, O people of the book, تَعَالَوْ إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ فَوَائِمْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ Come to common terms as between us and you. This is the formula that one has to use Try to find out what is the commonality that you can adopt and come to uh, know between you and him and you or her so that you can discuss that particular aspect and continue gradually with the subject and inshallah, hopefully in the conversation, it, when it develops, you will be able to convey gradually the message of Islam, inshallah. What you have to realize that if the person is interested in science, pick up the subject of science and discuss with him. If the person is interested in morality, pick up the subject of morality and discuss with him. Various subjects, alhamdulillah, can be adopted and inshallah. What uh, people forget that many a times when we discuss certain things and finally we realize that how we landed up with discussion. And then we go back and we know that we started with this particular note. What do you have to say? Just give a feeler and put an innocent questions of interest that he has or she has, and then you develop the subject. So depending on situation, or, uh, from situation to situation, a person, uh, identity and what personality a person has, depending upon that, you can dwell on the subject and inshallah, with the help of Allah, you will be able to convey the message of Islam. Jazakumullah uh, khairan. If we take a question from the brother there, please. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Dr. Rayman Zaytari. I'm a, a trainee surgeon. My question, because uh, both of you are doctors, as in the introduction, is um, how much for a common day Muslim professional person can um, find the balance between the career which you have to do as part of your life and, you know, 
livelihood and training and fulfilling the duty of having a profession which will help your brothers and sisters uh, in health and whatever. And then and having some time or how much time would you uh, be giving for dawa and on how le what level would you do this? So some practical idea from your both experiences. Thank you very much. I asked the question that being in a busy profession like a medical doctor, how can you balance between dawa and a medical pro and medical profession, and how can you do it, brother? Many people have an impression that if you have to dawa, you know you have to take out some time, maybe one hour in the evening or one hour in the afternoon or morning. This is not always true. The best is dawa should be at the back of your mind, and as a doctor, you can do better than any other profession because. For the patient that you look at, for him, next to God is doctor. For most of the patients, next to God, after God is doctor. So Alhamdulillah, you can do dawa more than any other profession. It doesn't mean that after you finish your practice, you should go to an organization. Fine, that also you can do. That's a specialized thing. But when you meet your non-Muslim patients, or your Muslim patients who know less about Islam, do Islam, when you meet a non-Muslim patient, it is the best opportunity. He will give you a better hearing than any other one, than anyone else. If anyone else tells him, he will not give a hearing. You, because you are treating him, he will listen to you more than anyone else. And how to do dawah, you can go to our website, irf.net, www.irf.net. There are various ways how you can do dawah. So not that you have to take out a particular time. It should be at the back of your mind always. Besides that, if you are free after your clinic hours, you can surely, if you are more interested, you can go one hour or two hours a day or thrice a week or every day, depending upon your schedule. And go to an organization or do volunteer work. But besides that, while you are working, you have the best opportunity that while talking to your patient, when he asks, suppose someone is, suppose someone is wearing a cross, your patient, Ask him a simple question. Brother, what is the cross you are wearing? At the back of your mind, you want to talk about Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was he crucified. You can't say, okay, brother John, I want to talk to you about Islam. He may give you a hearing because he's a patient. But better than that, ask a simple question. What is the cross you are wearing? That initiates. So he will tell you the cross is because he believes Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was crucified. Okay, where it is mentioned in the Bible? And you can start the dawah. Suppose... A Hindu man is wearing a tikka vermilion. Ask him what the tikka are wearing. Simple. In Christmas time, ask your patient, why do you all celebrate this Christmas? Not that you don't know. He will tell you, Christmas is celebrated because Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, our God and Lord was born on 25th of December. Oh, your God was born on 25th of December. Start. Initiate. Simple. You are next to God for him. Fine. So you ask him, and start. And regarding that topic, you should have some information. You can go to our website, irf.net. There inf is enough information on is Jesus God, is the Bible God's word, and all these topics, alhamdulillah. It's very easy. Or you can give a booklet. Hope that answers the question. Jazakallah um, khairan. This question is uh, from uh, sisters. And it's addressed to Dr. Zakir probably because of his charismatic manner of uh, conducting his talk. Uh, it says, uh, India has produced uh, many great scholars of a time, including the present day. After being uh, the ruling class for hundreds of years, why Muslims in India remain the minority? And given the present climate, uh, climate in India, e.g. Gujarat, what would you advise us in UK? This will ask a very good question and a very important question. I, I beg your pardon, it's not sister, I've just seen a name, it's a brother, it was a brother Talha, whoever it is. <laughs> the Talha asked a very good question that though the Muslims have ruled India for more than a thousand years, now we find that we are in minority, and especially just a few months back, we saw the riots, one of the worst riots that took place in the world where thousands of Muslims were killed. So how come this, what is the advice? 
for the Muslims. And why did this happen? Point number one, firstly I would blame this country, the British government. It has a policy of divide and rule. And that's how they divided our country. Now we have India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. If this Indian subcontinent wouldn't have been divided, then inshallah, the Muslims would have been majority in India. So point number one, I would blame them. Point number two, that we Muslims, we have not done our job. We haven't conveyed the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. If we would have conveyed the message of Islam in the right way as we should do, then we would not have been in the situation that we are today. Because if you would have explained to them Islam, then inshallah, we would have been in a better situation. Now what the Muslims should do is that we should be united. Unfortunately, we are not united. Not only in India, in most parts of the world, we aren't united. And very often, when election takes place, you know, one third of the vote go to party A, one third of the vote goes to party B, one third goes to party C. End result is zero. We don't have any say. What we have to do, we have to collectively decide and even if you agree that all are devils, you have to choose the best out of the lot. And what happens is that we should be united and all the different organizations, we should leave our differences and come on a common platform. And if we work unitedly, inshallah, we will be in a, in a, a, a much more better position. And what happened in Gujarat, it was planned very well by the Hindus. And we should see to it that that's not repeated. And unfortunately, unfortunately, we find that even after what happened in Gujarat, recently, when the elections took place, again that party won. We should see to it. And unfortunately, besides the Muslims of India, I would blame even the Muslims who are not living in India. Because believe me, not a single country, when about, about 10,000 Muslims were killed in a matter of few days or a couple of weeks, not a single Muslim country made a hue and cry. Not a single Muslim country. And the loss that took place to the Muslims of Gujarat was much more than the World Trade Center loss. It's a shame. So surely, the hadith of the Lord Muhammad that if anything happens to one Muslim, it's the duty of the other Muslim to help him out, which is not happening. The whole Muslim ummah is also to blame. Unless we unitedly stand together, you'll see to it that they will single us out slowly, slowly. But Allah has his ways. Allah has his ways. We have to see it's not happening here. It's happening throughout the world throughout the world. Unless we unitedly solve this problem, we will not be able to find a real solution. And we should see to it that we should leave our differences. The differences will be there. Let the differences be there. But at least for this purpose, we should come together. And Alhamdulillah, one thing good that happened that the, some of the Muslim brothers in UK, I mean a couple of Muslims who had gone to Gujarat and they were killed in the riots, being citizens of UK, MashaAllah, they took them to court. And the only case that is there, which I know of, in the international court of law, against, against the, the people who caused these rights, is here in UK. So Alhamdulillah, there are some brothers here working in UK. And this should increase. We should help such people to come together and make a voice unitedly and expose what's happening in different parts of the world against the Muslim, then only we will be able to be in a better position. Hope that answers the question. Jazakallah khairan, uh, brothers and the speaker. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Shabir Firuz. Uh, my question is, what is the meaning of Islam? Does it mean peace or does it mean submission? And can you please clarify this common misconception? Jazakallah. Um, did you get the question? Yeah. Okay, yeah. 
Brother has posed a question, what is the meaning of Islam? Does it mean peace or does it mean submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The word Islam, of course it is an Arabic word, is derived from a root word seen, lam, meme. As we know that all the Arabic words, most of them, they have tri-letter root word. Islam, the tri-letter root word is seen, lam, meme, which can be pronounced as film and salm. So the root word is film and salm. Film means submission and salm means peace. The word film is used, if you know, if you want the reference from the Quran, from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 208, when it says, Ya khulu fi filmi kafa. So submit yourself, enter into Islam wholeheartedly. So film here is for submission. If you want the reference for salm, which means peace, it is there in Surah Al-Anfal, chapter 8, verse number 60, wa in janahu salme fajnah laha, where if they seek peace, grant them. So word, Islam, the root word is film and salm both. It means peace and submission both. Jazakallah khairan. I wouldn't like to take a uh, guess where this question comes from because my pile has been mixed there. But I believe this is from a sister. Um, is there a single book or books where we can find quotes like mentioned by Dr. Shraib? which uh, we could study so that we could go, we could be prepared to talk to uh, EGI, Hindus, uh, etc., Hindu friends, and etc. The question is, is there any book uh, which mentions about the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad in Hindu scriptures? Yes, sister, there is, yes, the questioner, that books are written on the subject, Muhammad Sallallahu in world scriptures by the very same uh, heading, by Maulana Vidyarthi and other scholars also, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in World Scriptures, regarding biblical one, I already said Muhammad in Bible by Dawood, then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the natural successor to Christ, a booklet by Ahmad Didat, what the Bible says about Muhammad, again a booklet by Ahmad Didat. These are the booklets and books by authors which will help you to have the references for the uh, prophecy of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Apart from this, a video program, video cassette, which is delivered by Dr. Zakir Naik and available in a video form on the very subject Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in World Scriptures, which will have all the references and most of the references, and inshallah you can note down and help, that will be helpful to convey the message of Islam to them. Jazakallah, Jazakallah khairan. Um, if you take another question, Shundi. Assalamu alaikum to all the panel. Right, my question is to Dr. Zakir Naik. Your name, brother? Uh, Anzal Mahmood. Right. If I was giving dawah to a non-Muslim, yet they took no notice at all, or even worse, were being pushed away from the truth, should I continue to give them dawah or leave it between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The brother asked the question that if he gives dawah to a non-Muslim, and if they don't take much note of it, so should he leave? To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or what should you do? Should you continue? Brother, I would suggest that if you are doing dawah to the person and if he doesn't give heed to it, you change your tactics of dawah. You can continue, don't leave him. As much as possible, continue until he puts a gun on your head and says, Get out. Or oh, unless your life is in danger, you can continue. There's no problem. Inshallah, whether he agrees or not, you will get sawab. But you have to try and be effective. To be effective, you can change your style. Change your style in a way which he appreciates it. So for these, you have to see the cassettes of other speakers, how they do it. Or you can go to our site, www.irf.net, where we show that how to be effective. If you've got a dawah training program is there. And how to be effective without really directly offending them. But irrespective of whether they get offended or not. If you do dawah, whether they accept Islam or not, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Yashia, chapter number 88, verse number 21-22, فَذَكْرِ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرِ He tells the Prophet, your job is to deliver the message. Whether they accept or not is not in the hands of the Prophet. Neither in your hand, neither in my hand. It's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether they accept Islam or not. 
So you have to deliver the message and you will get your salah. But try it in the best way, as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125. Invite all the way of their Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Jazakallah khairan. A question from a sister who says that uh, Christians recognize our festivals and so wish us a happy Eid. What can we do or say to show respect at their festivals in order to promote da'wah? Um, if I can ask uh, Dr. Zakir to please take that question. Sister, the question that when we celebrate Eid, the Christians and non-Muslim, they wish us happy Eid. So what can we say when they have the festival to promote da'wah? The best opportunity, I believe, are the festivals. And Whenever you have a festival, whether it be Christmas, whether it be Ganesh Chaturthi, whether it be Hindu festival or a Christian festival, you can innocently ask them a simple question. For example, what is this Christmas? That initiates. And you can, the moment they reply, whatever they reply, then it gives you an opportunity to dawah. When you ask them what is Christmas, they will tell you Christmas, as I mentioned earlier. It is the birthday of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, who is almighty God, or the son of God. So here, the moment they say that, you have to, you can continue, if you know. You can say, can you take, give me any quotation in the Bible, which says that Jesus Christ, peace be upon almighty God. Because there was a person who I know, you know, some person who was, was claiming big things. A person by the name of Zakir was claiming that there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that it is God, that he says, worship me. Now, if you know, you can say directly. If you don't know that much, so you can take the help of some other speakers and then do dawah. And believe me, in this way, you can continue. They, they will not feel off. Even if they feel offended, no problem. You can continue. Or whether it's a Hindu or whether a non-Muslim, when these, when these uh, festivals take place, it becomes an opportunity, like as though you're asking an innocent question, Due to which they will not feel bad, but it gives an opportunity to clarify the Islamic concept as well as clarify the misconception uh, that they have about their religion. Hope that answers the question. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, we take a question from the brother. Assalamualaikum uh, My name is Shraz Um One thing I've found during uh, many of the conversations that I've had at university with uh, many people is that they're not really uh, what we could describe as Christians or as Jews, but rather. Um, for the few, and I'd say it's a minority, I think, who uh, do practice a little bit, they're very heavily uh, secular in their outlook. And the ma majority of people I've encountered tend to be very uh, capitalist orientated in their outlook towards life. So with these people, um, I was wondering, inshallah, if you could give us some advice on how we could show them the corruption of their ideology and of their way of life. If you can ask, uh, are you directing this to a particular uh, speaker? To anyone. If you can uh, please take that question. Well, there's posed a question that how to speak to those people who do not believe in Christianity, do not believe in Judaism, they are secular in nature, and how to uh, prove them that the ideology that they have about secularism is wrong and not correct. And in the previous answers, this question was answered saying that you have to search the interest of such a person, what is the field of interest? And once you tap that, for example, secularism itself, if that is the subject, try to dwell on the subject of secularism with him and compare with the ideology and system that they have and the system of Islam. Compare the system of secularism or communism or any ideology and inshallah, in comparison with Islam, Islam is the best way of living. Islam is the best code of living because the rules and regulations are given by the creator himself. And he is the creator. He knows what is best and what is good for humanity, his creation. So when you compare the system and ideology of Islam with any ideology, with, with any ism, inshallah, you will have superiority with the case of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises as it was quoted the various verses from the Quran chapter 48 verse number 28 
chapter 9 verse number 33 huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa dinil haqq li yuzhirahu ala din kulli that he will prevail the religion of deen over all isms whether it is judaism christianity communism secularism any ism so inshallah if you do that homework of comparison with the ideology and thinking what they have with islam inshallah you will be able to do the job jazakallah khairan um in taking a question from a sister sister asks that uh, jamal badawi says wisdom in dawa is to say the right thing at the right time in the right place at the right time one may conclude from what you said that you approach non muslims at any time and say anything if you get into difficulty then you go home and do your homework is this wisdom dr zakir naik please this is for the question that dr jamal badi said that when you speak to the non muslim you should speak the right thing at the right time and she said that i said that whenever you meet a muslim you should do dawa and then go and do your homework what dr jamal badwi said is perfectly fine but what you what you have said i said whenever you meet a non muslim even if you don't know anything at least say that there is one allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of keeping quiet if you keep quiet you get zero marks if you say it to a non muslim if you don't know the least you can say i said is there for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if they agree or don't agree at least you will get some up. so whatever you know the least a muslim can say is that there is one allah least if you know about dawa you can say a thousand things but the least a muslim can say no muslim can say i don't know about islam at all then you not a muslim at all so when i was trying to explain that the least you can say instead of not doing anything at least say that allah subhanahu wa taala even you may not be able to convince him instead of keeping quiet the same thing jamal badwi sorry jamal badwi when he said that you have to say the right thing at the right time so both are correct but instead of not saying anything at least say something that doesn't mean you have to keep quiet and even jamal badwi didn't say that you have to keep quiet so best is to say that if you know how to dawa if you are well versed with analyzing the thing and how to convey the message it is the best but if you are not experienced in the field the least you can do is say that allah subhanahu wa taala and then inshallah as time passes the moment you are not able to convince when they ask you a question you come and do your homework but even if you don't know the answer the moment you say that allah subhanahu wa taala and you are not able to convince at least you will get the sawab instead of keeping quiet but many a time the muslim they say you know i'm not in i don't know how to do dawa so they keep quiet and they let the opportunity go therefore i disagree with the opportunity being let away you should go and do dawa and try and convince in the best way that you can hope that answers the question um if we take a question from brother assalamu alaikum uh, this question is directed to brother zaik um basically your your speech is very enlightening um however there was one point which um i was was a bit mind geared on basically um you you kind of went endlessly on how um it's quite important to um uh you know do do the dawa work and the itikaf work even if um you know we know very little but basically you know and how you have to be like how it's important not to be a complete muslim not to you know it's not important that we get our full muslim community uh completely up to scratch um before we do the dawa work but my question is basically um in 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 from the muslim community i've been brought up with you know i've i've seen um you know the muslim community being very um being very divided among themselves so my question is what hope do we have for giving dawa to a third party when we ourselves are split with our um you know with our beliefs and our you know our uh doings for example if you know if you take the eid itself which is like um one of the um important celebrations in the um it's islamic in 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 the muslim thing um basically you know if we if we were doing it on two separate days what hope do we have for the like the third party to who we are doing dawa to to um take upon our heed when we are divided among ourselves jazakallah khair 
there was a question that when the dawah to non-Muslims, when the Muslims themselves are divided, for example, Eid, some people celebrate on different days. So if we ourselves are divided, how can we do dawah with the non-Muslims? Brother, I do agree that if the Eid is celebrated on different days in the same city, there will be little problem, but that should not, that should not disappoint us. Because Eid is something else that does not mean that a certain group of Muslims, they disagree that Eid should not be today, should be tomorrow. So that is a difference in opinion. That doesn't mean that if we differ, we cannot do dawah at all. And I said that dawah is important because if you say that I will become a great first I'll have enough knowledge on how to do dawah with non-Muslims and then start doing dawah, I say that time will never come. If you say first I'll read about Islam and then start doing dawah, that time will never come. The moment you start and you cannot answer, you immediately try and find the answer. But if you do not start doing dawah, the time will never come. Therefore my advice is that whatever little bit you know, you at least start. They may not agree with you. The, the moment you don't agree with you, you go and try and do your homework. For example, if you fail an examination, what do you do? If you fail an examination, you go and do your homework so the next time you pass. But if you don't talk at all for years together, then you miss, then you'll never start doing dawah. So my advice is that whatever little bit you know, you have to start as a blood prophet Muhammad said, Balli go anni walo aya. Propagate even if you know one verse. Now if there is difference in opinion for certain things like about Eid or anything else, that should not be a major thing. It is a problem. It's a minor problem. Because if suppose at that time the Muslims differ, some have eat today, some have eat tomorrow, that should not be a major problem. That's not an issue in which because if the Muslims differ, that means you can't do dawah at all. You can show you. I mean, the full year is there. So what we should do, if these small mistakes are there, and because of that you say that, okay, I will not do dawah, I feel this is an excuse on the point of the Muslims to prevent doing dawah. See, we, Alhamdulillah, even in Bombay, it's the same thing. There are different opinions. But yet we are doing dawah. We are doing dawah with thousands of people. Thousands of people. And there are hardly any non-Muslims who object and tell us that why, why do the Muslims object? Why do the Muslims differ? Yeah, there's a little bit problem. There will be a little bit problems in it. But that should not be a real case for not doing dawah. These are just small points which a person should neglect and should be interested in conveying the message of Islam to them. Jazakallah khairan. Um, a question from a sister who has specifically asked that this uh, be answered by Dr. Zakir Naik. She says that at my workplace, my non-Muslim colleagues, my, my non-Muslim colleague has a Muslim partner out of wedlock. My colleague seems quite interested in Islam, yet the Muslim seems reluctant to consider even a small aspect of Islam. How can I tackle this situation? Because so far, I do not feel like I'm achieving much. Just repeat the question. At my workplace, my non-Muslim colleague has a Muslim partner out of wedlock. My colleague seems quite interested in Islam, but the Muslim seems reluctant to consider even a small aspect of Islam. How can I tackle with the situation? Because so far, I do not feel since I am achieving that I've achieved anything. Well, what, what the sister is saying is that she has a friend at work, mm. and the friend has a Muslim partner that they're living together, not married. Uh, and uh, the partner, the non-Muslim partner, the, uh, the friend of the sister, she or he is very much interested in Islam, but the Muslim uh, partner is not at all. And she's trying to kind of tackle this issue, but without much success. So she's asking for some advice, some tip. In short, the two partners, one is Muslim, one non-Muslim, yes. and trying your level best to do dawah with the non-Muslim. Yes. That's fine. As far as doing dawah to non-Muslim is concerned, as it's a similar question asked by several people, it's continuing, that when we do dawah to a non-Muslim, 
The best is to try and try and understand what the non-Muslim is interested in. If the, if the non-Muslim is interested in science, talk about science. If they're interested in anything dealing with, with character, deal with character. If the non-Muslim is interested in talking about history, talk about history. Do it, Dr. Zakir, I think the, the, it, the, the obstacle or the problem is the Muslim partner, it's not the non-Muslim. Muslim the the, the non-Muslim partner wants to learn about Islam or he or she is interested uh, on Islam. But it's the Muslim who is becoming the obstacle. He, he or she is not wanting to know anything about Islam at all. Uh, now, how, how can this friend tackle this issue? The Muslim is the obstacle. Since the Muslim is not interested in speaking about Islam and the non-Muslim is more interested, yeah. how can she do the job? It is both, you have to do Islam, at the same time do Dawah. Islam is speaking about Islam to a Muslim who is just a namesake Muslim. So what we have to do is that we have to speak about Islam to the Muslims also. That's what's important because some people are just namesake Muslims. So you have to talk about Islam to that namesake Muslims that what is right and what is wrong. At the same time you have to speak with the non-Muslims who is interested in Islam. So what we have to do is that if suppose certain person is just a namesake Muslim, then we have to talk about Islam. And the reason is that some of the people are just namesake Muslims. We have to talk about Islam, talk about science. For example, there's a talk I've given on Quran and modern science. And if we talk about Quran and modern science as compared, what is comparable or not comparable, it helps us in conveying the message. Similarly, on the other hand, the Muslim likes Islam, but the Muslim who's a namesake Muslim, he is not too much in favor. So we have to see to it and try and convince them. Convince the Muslim who's a namesake Muslim that Dawah is compulsory. At the same time, convey the non-Muslims and tell the non-Muslims about Islam. What happens that many a times, because these namesake Muslims, they don't know about Islam, they are an obstacle, so we have to do Islam with them. Islam with them and try and, because they're namesake Muslims, so we have to give them books. And if you see my video cassette, Women's Rights in Islam is there, Quran and Modern Science is there, whether um, the Universal Brotherhood is there, and several other cassettes are there. You have to convince them that Islam is the best way of life so that you can convey them about the Islamic, Islamic aspect as well as with the non-Muslims to convey them that Islam is the best way of life. Zakallahu uh, khairan. Before I take a question uh, from uh, the brother here, I think uh, I'll take one written question from the brother's side. Brother Muhammad, <coughs> brother Muhammad Yusuf asks that, have we any active preaching body to count Qadiani satellite? We have a problem here in the UK where we have uh, the Qadiani sect who use an, uh, a satellite channel to carry out the preaching. The question posed is that the Qadianis have a satellite channel, and I'm aware of it, that. that the Qadianis, that they have a channel known as the MTV, the Muslim TV, and it is there since several years. It's a shame that there is not a single Muslim channel which is based only on Islam. It's a shame. Just a few years back, they started with the Ikra TV, which is mainly in Arabic, but there is not a single satellite channel talking about Islam as a full-time channel. If there are some channels like uh, ARY Digital, which speaks a couple of hours you find every year talking, every day, a couple of hours, but there is not a single channel talking about the Dawah of Islam as a full-time channel. And these Qadianis, though if you analyze the Qadianis, they have a channel which is a full-time channel, which is though it's deviant away from Islam, it's, they, they try and they have a satellite channel which is called as MTV, Muslims TV or Qadiani. So what we have to do, we have to have our own satellite channels that is talking about the correct aspects of Islam. And recently when I've heard that there is a channel which I started from, from, uh, from uh, uh, which is settled in uh, South Africa. Though they have satellite channels in South Africa as well as in uh, Saudi Arabia. And the channel which is based only on full time on, on, on Islam. And it started by 
um, based in, it has got a channel, USA, as well as in uh, uh, South Africa. And it's a satellite channel, I forgot the name. The name, it is uh, Al Majad. Al Majad satellite channel, which has started, Alhamdulillah. It is only a satellite channel, mainly in uh, uh, English, mainly English. So Alhamdulillah, they had first in Arabic, now they have started in English. What we have to do, that we have to have several satellite channels. Alhamdulillah, Islamic Research Foundation have got programs which are shown every day, Alhamdulillah. The Islamic satellite channels, the IRF channels, every day we are shown half an hour to no less than three different satellite channels. And we are mainly, basically, we are covering all the countries in Europe, all the countries in Africa, as well as in Asia. We have shown various satellite channels. For example, it's in uh, ARY Digital. ARY Digital is there. It's also there in, it's shown on uh, ETC. ETC is there. It's a channel, mainly a channel of the music satellite. It's a music satellite channel of the Hindus. But because we are showing on free, Alhamdulillah, it's covered every day, as well as showing on various satellite channels. What we have to do is that we have to convey the right message of Islam and try and see to it that these channels of the Qadianis, we should be able to reply that what they show wrong things about Islam. And then only can we able to convey the right message. Hope that's the question. Jazakallah khairan. If we, uh, I'm, so, I'm afraid that we're coming to the end of uh, uh, the session. I'll take one question from the brothers and uh, one question from the sisters uh, as the last uh, activity for tonight. The brother, please. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. My name is Uzair Akhtar. I, since I started reading and studying, I always find that Muslims are brushing their issues with other countries like today. Dr. Zakir said that it is British government's conspiracy that they divided India. I will give one example, 26th January to three years before in Gujarat, same place, there was earthquake. All countries supported India. When Muslims went there to get some money to some grain, Hindus told them, tell Jai Ram, then you will get. They, they told, no, we are not getting from you. We are going back. When our Muslim brother will come, they will help you. Next time, when after one week, one month, Muslim went there, they went with all different banners. Jamaat-e Ahl-e sing another banner. Jamaat-e Islami, another banner. Hanfi Jamaat, another banner. Tablighi Jamaat, a different banner. The, this is also conspiracy of the British government or American government. Quran says, Auzubillah min shaitan rajim Qawm word is common here, Nakara. Their problem is economical, educational, social. They are responsible. If Muslims are beaten anywhere, it is their responsibility to introspect themselves. It is not a good responsibility, a good manner, I, I am sorry, in a community in a Mus with the Muslims that it is the responsibility of this country, it is the conspiracy of this country. This is not my question. My question is to Dr. Uh, Shoaib Sahab. The question, he recited many things from Hindu scripture. I just want to know what about, if those scriptures are talking about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's okay, we are taking it. What about if those scriptures are talking about Ajodhya, about Banaras, about Delhi, Yuri, Yuri where, where our Mandir demolished and Masjid are erected? Are we are going to accept those things as well? This is my question. Sorry. Jazakallah, brother. The question posed by brother is that if you are accepting the prophecies from the Hindu scriptures, then what about those things which speaks about Ayodhya, which speaks about demolition, which speaks about, which speak about in short, anti-Islam? Brother, what we have to take the truth, whatever truth is there in the scripture, though it is completely falsehood, we have to take the truth for the very purpose of doing dawah to them. We are not considering the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad based on their scripture. 
even if it is nothing mentioned in the scripture, still we believe that Prophet Muhammad sallam, was the messenger of God. We do not have, we need not have any certificate from those scripture. The only purpose that we want to refer from those scriptures, to quote them from the scripture, is to convey the message of Islam to them. We do not agree with the other parts of the scripture. We do not say that those scriptures are authentic in a sense that it is the word of God. We only say that certain truths are there in their book. Certain truths are there which says that Prophet Sallallahu is the messenger of God. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is the Rishi that will come in future. So we are just tapping that. We do not say that other parts are also authentic. Maybe certain truths are there. And there are several books which speaks about certain truths, but many things are false. So just because other things are false, we deny the, those truths which are present in there. I hope this satisfies you. Jazakallah khairan. Before I present the last question, um, I'd like to apologize for the brothers who were queuing up uh, to ask questions. Unfortunately, time is not allowing us to do so. I'm going to join two questions, uh, Dr. Z uh, Zakir, they're both for you. Uh, I could not leave one out uh, because uh, they both seem to be far cries uh, from a parent, from a mother in particular by the looks of it. One of them says, my son is a student who occasionally has to travel with non-Muslims to, to another city to study. My concern is that rather than he giving his non-Muslim colleagues, uh, friends, da'wah, he instead attempts to fit in with them and act like them and hang out in their places. How can I encourage my son to change his attitude uh, and give his friends a dawah? This is one question. The second one, again from a mother, she says that most of the time we women are trying to teach our children about Islam. Is that a sin if we don't give dawah to any non-Muslim? The question posed is that some of the parents, some of the children, they are so much influenced by the non-Muslims that when they go to colleges, etc., they would not like to talk about Islam and they are more effective and they are more much uh, impressed by what non-Muslims do. And is it, is it a fard? Is it compulsory that we should do dawah? Yes, as Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Asr, which I also said earlier in my talk, in Surah Asr, chapter 103, verse 1 to 3, which says, Wal Asr, inna al insana fi khusr. That by the token of time, man is very in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, to dawa, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. So dawa is fard for every Muslim or every human being for that person to go to Jannah. If he does not enter Jannah, if he does not do dawa, they shall not enter Jannah. It's compulsory. Now how to see to it that our children they do dawah. It is because most of the things, many of the parents and even the people, the children, they do not know the advantages as well as the good things about Islam. Many of them, they are apologetic about the religion. Because they are apologetic, they feel, okay, for namesake, we are Muslims and they are very much impressed by the non-Muslims. What we have to do is that we have to prove, alhamdulillah, that Islam is the best way of life and the good things about Islam. If we prove to them that, alhamdulillah, Islam is the best way of life, Islam is a more scientific religion, as compared to, to Christianity or any other religion, they'll be proud of their religion. The reason they like being with non-Muslims is because they think that Islam is not the best way of life. What we have to do is that we have to prove to these Muslims, who are namesake Muslims, that Islam is the best way of life. So we have to let them read certain books like Islam, which proves that Islam is the best way of life, Quran and modern science, and prove to them that Christianity is not the best way of life, that if you read the Bible, Bible is against science and technology. And Quran, if you read Quran, what is mentioned in the Quran today, what Quran is mentioned, the scientific points we have come to know recently, what is mentioned in the Quran is 1400 years back like we learn today from science, that, that we have come to know that about the Big Bang Theory. 
how did the world came into existence. And what is mentioned in the Quran is 14 years back, which we came to know recently, maybe 50 years back, 100 years back. We previously did not know that Quran, that, that today the world is spherical in nature. The first time we have come to know that the earth is spherical is, seven, is 1597 when they came to know that when they, they sailed around the earth. And this is mentioned in the Quran 14 years back. In Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30. Previously, we thought that the light of the moon is its own light. Recently, yesterday in science, maybe 50 years back, 100 years back, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it's a reflected light. Now, this is mentioned in the Quran 14 years back. Previously, we thought that the light, that the sun, that the sun was stationary. Recently, we have come to know that the sun rotate about its own axis. In school, we have come to know recently, 50 years back, which is mentioned in the Quran 14 years back. So when we tell them that, Alhamdulillah, Islam is a scientific way of life, which is far superior than any other way of life, then they'll be proud to be Muslims. Unfortunately, we feel that Islam is not the best way of life. If we tell our children that it's the best way of life and prove to them that Islam is the best way of life, inshallah, they will be proud to be Muslims. And we have to talk to them about books regarding Dawa, etc. And then these children of us, they'll be proud to be Muslims and they'll convey the message to the non-Muslims also. Hope that answers the question. Wa'akhir da'wan, alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khairan. Before we finalize uh, and conclude the program, uh, I'll request all the brothers and sisters to remain seated uh, for the next uh, five to ten minutes. Can I ask uh, Brother Yusuf Chambers uh, to come up here and uh, literally within three minutes uh, say what he has to say, please? Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. Thank you very much for being patient tonight. I need to remind you and reiterate upon what the scholars have said tonight about giving dawah and supporting dawah, supporting this work. Dawah doesn't just necessarily mean, by the way, going out, putting a table and putting lots of books on top of it and sitting in uh, small heath here and waiting for the non-Muslims to come. Dawah can be supporting the people who do that work. It can be putting money in a hat or a bucket. It can be, you know, writing a letter and complaining about, you know, Islamophobia, which we see in this country at the moment, you know, and which we've seen, in, in fact, uh, you know, in this country for years and years. So, before you leave, you will find some people collecting in a device, a bucket, I don't know what it is, I haven't seen it, and it's to pay for this event. And if, on the face of it, you may see this event as just another event. But there's something quite special about this event. It's quite unique. In fact, we have one organization from India, the IRF. We have one which is based in London and is doing extensive DAO work, uh, the CRC. And we have IPCI, which you all know and love, probably. And we have Muntada al-Islami. So this is four organizations. We've heard a lot of questions tonight and comments and observations made by, the, by you, you know, yourselves regarding uh, you know, people being uh, splintered, you know, scattered in this dawah. We have four organizations tonight who said, no, we are going to make ta'aun, we are going to make cooperation, we are going to work together in this, in, in this deen, and we are going to put this message forward for the whole of the humanity, particularly as we're living in a non-Muslim country. And there are 80 90% of the people in this country, I was one of them 12 years ago, that don't know the first thing about the purpose of life. You know, so this is really what I have to tell you, that if you don't know the purpose of life, you know, then you're going to be misled, and you're going to try and mislead other people. And, you know, as uh, Dr. Zaki Anaik has just said, in relation to, uh, you know, the question about somebody inviting, you either, you're going to invite, or you will be invited to. So, in this, in this country, particularly in this time, in this critical time for Dawah, the scholars are calling this the critical time for Dawah, we need to reach out and support the people who are doing Dawah. 
And if this means IPCI, you support them. If this means IRF, IRF, yeah, <laughs> got it, you support them. If this means George Bush is giving dawah, you support him because he's been giving dawah lately. If you don't know, there's 40,000 people who became Muslim, Muslim since September the 11th in his own country. I happen to know in the last five years in the prisons, 5,000 5, Muslims in the prisons. 1,571 people took shahada in the last five years with no dawah in the prisons. So why is that? Why is that? Is that because you guys got up and told them? Is that because you visited the Muslims in the prisons? Is that because you exhorted one another, you know, another to, to, to the righteousness, to patience and truth? Or is it because we just sat down and did nothing? Because this is the reality, brothers and sisters. Right now, we're sitting and we're doing nothing. We're sitting and complaining and moralizing and doing nothing. And then we expect that who's going to pay for this hall tonight, for instance? We just expect that somebody else, oh, don't worry, there's probably a businessman, he'll pay the bill, 3,000, 4,000, whatever it is, I don't know what it is, but I'm telling you that if each and every one of us commands the good, forbids the evil, says that we're Muslims and is upon the righteous way and we put one or two pounds in that bucket tonight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase it, the barakah will increase and we will maybe have money to pay for three halls or four halls or maybe ten Zakir Naiks, inshallah. So, I don't know if I've said that too forcefully or whether I've said it from my own desires but I do love this deen. I know it's the only way. I know that communism has failed the world. I know that capitalism has failed the world. And I know Islam is the only way forward. And that is clear. Even the non-Muslims are saying this. If you listened the other day, and you would have seen Yvonne Ridley, or heard her, may Allah help her, on the radio station, defending Islam. Defending Islam. And she's a Muslim, so she can defend Islam. And the non-Muslims were phoning in, defending her. And even Campbell himself, Mr. Campbell, you know the one who hates Islam, the one, Five Live. Even he had to admit that women's rights in Islam, as written in the Quran, revealed in the Quran 1400 years ago or more, were incredible. So, Islam is needed. We have at the moment Barclays, NatWest, considering selling houses via Sharia methods. We have, in every sense of the word, the only way, the only way forward now, Al-Islam. And we are the foot soldiers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we are not the foot soldiers, who is? Is it the Times? Is it the Sun? Is it Radio 5 Live? Is it Mr. Campbell who hates Islam? He admitted it. Is it James Whale who hates Islam and decries Islam every week? Or is it us? Are we upon the righteous path? Or are they? Do they know Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Or do we? Do we make it of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa or do they? It's us. It's us. It's us. And it's organizations like this coming together, making ta'awn, making cooperation is the only way forward. This is how we will destroy the enemies of Islam. 